Who does better in life? People who give all the time or people who take all the time? Is it really true that procrastination can sometimes be a superpower? And what are the keys to being truly original? We're going to answer these questions today as we dive into the work of organizational psychologist Adam Grant. Adam Grant has written a number of New York Times best-selling books and we're going to explore them today in depth where we're going to identify some of the most useful learnings you can get in terms of becoming original and truly creative, one of a kind, and also why it pays to be a giver rather than a taker. Now, unfortunately, Adam does not have as much controversy as some other thought leaders that we're studying. So I am going to do my very best to, to dig up as much dirt as possible on him. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Welcome to another episode of the Change Your Minds podcast. I'm Owen Fitzpatrick, and today we're going to be looking at the work of Adam Grant. This is one of two episodes that we're going to dedicate to the books that Adam Grant has written. Now, who is Adam Grant? Well, Adam Grant is an organizational psychologist that has been rated as Wharton's top professor for seven straight years. He's a number one New York Times bestselling author. His books have been translated into more than 35 languages and have been named among the best by the likes of Amazon, Apple, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review. His New York Times article on languishing was one of the most shared articles in all of 2021. And Adam also hosts two podcasts, Rethinking as well as Work Life, which is a chart-topping TED original podcast. His TED Talks on original thinkers and givers and takers have been viewed by more than 30 million people. Millions of followers continuously consume his content on social media, is extremely popular, and I figured it would be doing a disservice to the field of psychology if I did not do the work of Adam Grant. Now today, although Adam has written a number of books, he's written one of my favorite books out there, which is called Think Again. He's written, his latest book is called Hidden Potential. We're gonna get into that on another episode. But today we're gonna to focus on the first of his books, which are Give and Take and Originals. These books explore not only the nature of originality, but also who gets ahead in life, who succeeds. Is it people who give all the time or people who take? And there are some surprising findings that we're gonna be exploring as we go through it. As always, on the work of series, you know what you're gonna get here. You're not only gonna get the information, you're not only gonna get an intense exploration of everything that Adam talks about, or not everything, but a lot of the stuff he talks about in these books. You're also gonna get my opinion and my perspective and my thoughts and my criticisms as well. I don't have too many criticisms, but whenever I get a chance to create a bit of controversy, oh, by goodness, I'm gonna do that. See, I was even avoiding the word by God to be politically correct. That's how unlikely it is that I'll be polarizing you after this episode, but I will try. And so today, let's start with the very first book that Adam Grant wrote, which was Give and Take, Why Helping Others Drives Our Success. And in this book, Adam Grant reveals a lot of the research he's done. He's very prolific when it comes to research studies, and he's done many, many, many studies around the area of generosity and around the area of what does it mean to be a giver? What does it mean to be a taker? And who does the best in life? And in this book, he dives into the research that he's done and other people have done on this particular area of focus. What Adam Grant found was that givers, takers, and matchers tend to be three different types of categories, if you will, of people that exist in the world. You have people who tend to give all the time. These are people who give without expecting anything in return. You've got takers who always prioritize their own self-interest. And then you've got matchers who are striving for a balance between giving and receiving. If they get something, they'll be more likely to give back to you. But if you take from them, well, they'll want to take back from you as well. And so with these three different styles, it really starts, and one of the main questions Adam asks in this particular book is who does the best? Like, which is the best style to go with? And the counterintuitive conclusion, and this is a bit of a spoiler alert, so be prepared, is that the best style or best approach to have is to be a giver, but it's also potentially the worst. And we'll dive into the nuance as to what makes a giver someone who's gonna be very successful and what makes a giver someone who's gonna actually come at the very bottom in terms of success. We're gonna look at both as we go into the, the, the meat of this book. Professionally, most people tend to be matchers. It's because the metaphor that we use for business sort of looks at that way. We believe that the workplace is zero sum to a degree. So you either get it or you don't. 
And also there's plenty of people that are more than likely going to be takers in business and you don't want to be vulnerable in that context and leave yourself open to be taken advantage of. What Grant goes into is he looks at how these three groups tend to build networks. So givers, for example, tend to build very expansive and helpful networks with lots of people because they're helping lots of people without expectation of return and therefore they're building a lot of goodwill. Whereas takers and matchers limit their networks to a certain degree because it's more transactional from that perspective. Givers tend to be build better reputations. They tend to create more useful networks and these useful networks allow them to have private information or access to very special information, diverse skills, as well as power. Now your social networks are generally speaking composed of strong ties and weak ties. And the again counterintuitive insight here is that while strong ties are people that you're super close to, weak ties are people that you just are connected to whatnot but not very close to. But people are much more likely to benefit from weak ties than from strong ties. And in many ways this is a particularly useful thing to be aware of is that so often we think that we have to become best friends in our network with people in order to be able to benefit. But actually the research shows that if we have a decent enough connection with someone and someone is in our network and we have done things for them, we've been generous, we've expanded the value that we're offering other people, that oftentimes that can provide us with a lot of benefit as a result. Now, the problem is it's sometimes hard when you're building a network, it's sometimes hard to be able to figure out who's a taker and who's a giver. And takers can fake it really, really well, right? They can pretend to be givers. They can go, oh yes, no problem. But actually they're looking to take all the time. And so how do we get the clues that will reveal to us someone who is really uh, a taker in a giver's clothing? You know, the wolf in the sheep's clothing. Like, I don't know what clothing a, a giver would wear. Um, probably not very nice because they've given their clothes away. Do you get it? Because no, okay. I'm sorry. It's 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 been a long day, um, already. So the the real trick to looking at this is first of all, how do they communicate? Are they very much self-absorbed in the way they communicate? Do they use a lot of personal pronouns, or do they use terms like we? People who are givers tend to use we and our and us more than they use I or me. Also, do they tend to put themselves front and center and look for every opportunity for publicity? Do they tend to try to get as much from every interaction as possible? Are they very hard negotiators? Ken Lay of Enron is, is mentioned by um, Adam as someone who looked to be a giver but actually was a taker. Obviously, we can tell that from the story of Enron. But takers tend to use a lot more self-promoting information and feature arrogant quotes and whatnot. There's a great study done by Daniel Kahneman, which is an ultimatum game. I used to play this when I was delivering workshops a few years ago to help people understand about decision making. And basically what he would do is he would give people, they would play a game where people would get a chance to split $12 evenly with a taker who had public information of making fair deals in the past or splitting $10 with a matcher. And over 80% of people chose to take the latter deal. So 80% of people decided that they would prefer to split money evenly with someone even though they would get slightly less money because that person had a good reputation and was fair, right? And I think that's interesting, but it's it speaks to our inbuilt need for fairness, the fact that we try to always make sure that things are corrected. And our effort at saying no to the whole $6 each thing is our effort to go, screw you. You think you're so good, you screw other people over? Well, I'm gonna screw you out of $6. So there you go. Fascinating. Danny Kahneman, wonderful legend, very sadly passed away recently. So author of an incredible book, Thinking Fast and Slow, by the way, just one of that noise, a great follow up. Anyway, Adam Grant continues by talking about collaboration and sharing credit. Givers take to tend to collaborate more and prioritize group success, whereas spoiler alert, takers tend to be all about themselves. The more giving the group members are, the more successful they tend to be in terms of group performance and also even individual raises. Givers focus more on achieving the goals of the group and see collaboration as harnessing the best from multiple people. Givers focus on the success of the group rather than the success of the self. And this allows them to build, and this is a really cool concept called idiosyncrasy credits, where they're going to get more leeway for controversial thought. So this would really help me out, right? You know the way I come up with some weird ideas plenty of the time and a lot of times people are like, what are you talking about? You're an idiot. But if I had more idiosyncrasy credits, 
that would make people more likely to go, wait, sit here, let's listen to him. That's all I need. All I need is you to listen to me. And then I come up with the gold. I drop the wisdom. But unfortunately, my idiosyncrasy credits are not very high. And that's not because I'm a taker. It's just because I'm not a very good giver. No, I'm a good giver. One of the things I didn't see in this book is he didn't really talk about what you give, right? I mean, he touched on it, but really, who's to say what's valuable to give? That's, that's a rabbit hole we'll leave for another day. Anyway, giving is also contagious. So when you start to give in a group, other people start to give as well. It creates a safe space where people feel free to be comfortable with giving. They don't feel that they're going to be taken advantage of by the takers. Takers tend to be punished societally by spreading a bad reputation about them, such as the poor people that suffered the loss of those $6 that they could have gotten in Danny Kahneman's game. There was a look at the performance of cardiac surgeons who changed hospitals. And even though they were doing super well in one hospital, when they went to the other hospital, it doesn't always translate because a superstar isn't always a superstar by themselves. Often it's the way in which they work with people and the support that they have. An example that Adam also gives is the difference between Frank Lloyd Wright as a taker and former Simpsons, Simpsons writer George Mayer as a giver. Uh, with Frank, there was an anecdote of his son John asked to be paid for his work as an assistant and Wright gave a bill itemizing his cost since birth. <laughs> Which is wonderful. Imagine doing that. Imagine you get your child to work as an assistant to you. And then they go, hey, you know, dad, is there, is there any way, is there any way I can get some payment for this? And you go, sure, if you pay me first. And then what you do is you spend time, you sit down at your laptop. Like think about the mentality here. I love this. You sit down at your laptop, open up an Excel sheet and you start calculating. Okay. How much was it when the pregnancy occurred? How, how much did we spend on pregnancy medication? How much do, do we spend, you know, for the actual delivery? Okay, great. Accommodation. What are we going to rate that per day, right? For like 18 years. Okay, no problem. Let's add in the food. So how much are we going to budget for food? What about their share of the holiday? I mean, I think this is legendary in many ways. Then George Mayer, who was a giver and known as a giver. He wrote for Saturday Night Live. He would take the grunt work of writing sketches for less glamorous guests. He would re rewrite other people's first drafts so he didn't get that much credit, but eventually got a feature done about him in The New Yorker and multiple Emmys. So that's a great example of that. Empathy, it tends, and again, this is something that Grant started to talk about, is research shows that other-centered empathy tends to develop between the ages of 14 and 18 months. And what we also know is that there's what's called a responsibility bias, which is when we exaggerate our contributions relative to those of others. So our notion in our own mind of how much we give, we tend to exaggerate them in how we think about them. For instance, three out of four couples have added their own contributions to the relationship as more than 100%. In other words, both parties would say something along the lines of, well, I give 70% uh, of this relationship I give. And the other person would say, I give 60%, which would come to 130, that kind of thing. One of the ways to correct for this and to overcome this responsibility bias is to list, first of all, what your partner contributes first before you estimate your own contribution. So for instance, when employees first think about how much their bosses have helped them before valuing their own contributions, they double the percentages of their boss's contributions. Right. So if you think about what this means, it means that our natural tendency is to over exaggerate how much we give and undervalue how much other people give unless we focus first on how much the other person gives and then we're much more accurate in that way. And this chasm of empathy that causes responsibility bias tends to be called the perspective gap. And this is the fact that it's sometimes difficult for us to be able to jump into someone else's shoes to be able to look at how other people are seeing things. So just because we feel from our perspective, we're giving, 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 doesn't necessarily mean that other people have the same experience. And takers rarely cross this perspective gap. Givers tend to be better at this because what they tend to do is they tend to visualize themselves in someone else's shoes and really start to imagine what it would be like to be them. And that's what, that is what allows them to be so freely in terms of giving. Doctors consistently think their patients are feeling less pain than the patients themselves rate. So this perspective gap is something that exists across the board in lots of different contexts. But the main key takeaway here 
is that we need to get better at stepping into someone else's shoes so that we can start to find the kind of things that are important to them and that will help us to be better givers as a result. Grant goes on and talks about the importance of recognizing and nurturing potential. He talks about how givers excel at seeing potential in others and helping them develop. And if you look at the great study that I've mentioned on previous podcasts, The Big Million Effect, this is the art of whenever you see someone else and you expect the best of them, the way you treat them tends to bring out the best of them. And so it's really important to recognize that having higher expectations of a person leads to increase in performance. But what Grant suggests is that sometimes we overemphasize the current performance and the talent of a person, right? There's a great book called Range um, by David Epstein, where he talks about the fact that certain people tend to have a whole range of different skills that they practice as they grow up and other people tend to be just all about one thing. And we tend to fall in love with this concept of talent where some people are just talented and other people aren't. Other people have just to work hard at it. And actually the glorification of talent is a problem because as a result of that, that negatively impacts our ability to be able to promote what Professor Carol Dweck calls a growth mindset. And certainly growth mindset is something that uh, Adam Grant talks about quite a bit. In the rest of the book, he talks about the importance of what he calls powerless communication as opposed to powerful. So powerful communication is when you tell people what to do, you influence with authority. Whereas power, powerless communication is something that givers use a lot more. And it's basically demonstrating a bit more vulnerability and openness. It's characterized, it's characterized really by being able to be more vulnerable, be able to ask more questions, ask more advice. And as a result of that, you tend to do quite well. There's what's known as a generous tit for tat, which is an effective stance that can be used where you adopt a sort of a giver style and you, once they give back to you, you then match and every now and then you might actually forgive them. So even if they take, instead of matching them at that moment in time, you'll still give those times. Powerful communication works when listeners are dutiful followers. Powerless communication works a lot more effectively when we're talking to peers or when we're trying to manage up, for instance. And it's really important to be able to master the art of powerless communication. Takers tend to be more vulnerable to threats to their ego. They tend to discount constructive feedback. So they st would struggle with powerless communication because powerless communication really comes from signaling vulnerability, whereas powerful communication tries to exert dominance or establish dominance. Takers might enjoy that, Powerless communication is effective because people are naturally skeptical of intentions and they don't like to be ordered around. And so by asking questions and by showcasing your vulnerability, being receptive to new ideas and different points of view, it means that you build trust a lot more effectively. Givers are more interested in what they can do to help and not necessarily about trying to show who's the most powerful person out there. Adam gives an example where he presented in front of some military officers and he knew that they had a perspective of him or a perception of him where what would this kid know? And therefore he started off with saying, I know what you're thinking, what can I possibly learn from a professor who's 12 years old? And then immediately he used what he called the pratfall effect, which is when mistakes tend to amplify the audience's conception about you. So whenever you see a person make a mistake, instead of it making you think less of them, it actually makes you think more of them because they're showcasing their vulnerability. Therefore, you trust them more and therefore you're more likely to rate them as more likable as a result. Givers are trying to help, trying to help you solve your problem. And therefore, they not only want to ask questions to understand what's really going on, they also, as I mentioned, want to ask advice. And advice is for benefits. It allows you to learn information. It allows you to step into their shoes and take their perspectives. It allows you to build commitment. So one of Robert Cialdini's seven principles of influence is commitment and consistency. Whenever we get advice from someone or we get a favor for someone, they're more likely to give us a bigger one later on. Why? Well, because they've already started the process and they have to be consistent with their prior decisions. And also flattery is another thing. If, if I ask you for your opinion or if I ask you for your advice on something, I'm telling you, I rate your advice. And so if anyone wants to ask my advice on anything, feel free. You know, I like to be flattered. So advice seeking tends to work with all three styles. It works with givers, it works with takers, and it works with matchers. Grant gives a number of different examples of how this works. Again, I definitely recommend checking out his book to be able to explore it. The other thing that he talks about in the book is he talks about selfless givers. And this is really where we get to the crux of what makes the difference between givers who succeed at the very top and givers who 
end up at the very bottom. And he talks about selfless givers who might burn out due to neglecting their own needs and otherish givers, right? A little bit of a dodgy sort of term, but look, I've made up enough uh, words in my time to be okay with that. So what he says is that self-interest and other interest are completely independent motivations. In other words, you can have both. It's not an either or. It's not like I'm self-interested or I'm other interested. You can have both. But he suggests that givers who have low self-interest are selfless. They sacrifice their own gain for the benefit of others. This is what he calls pathological altruism, and it decreases their well-being and risks burnout. They also find it very difficult to ask for help. They find it difficult to say no. Whereas givers that are successful, and this is the key part, tend to have high self-interest as well as be focused very much on others. So they're ambitious, they have goals related to gaining influence and attaining excellence. They give more than they receive, of course, but they discriminate with their time in terms of who to give to and what to give. And that's an important piece. So if you are gonna be a giver and you're gonna decide that's how you're gonna live your life, wonderful, but it's important to be aware of that. It's also important to make sure that the result of the giving is made obvious. So for example, one of the challenges with being a teacher is it might take years for the children to grow up and to show the great work that you've done. So you wanna to try to have some sort of feedback mechanism there. Grant suggests chunking, which is the practice of combining your, let's say, giving into one day of the week or a particular section, almost like batching your giving, as opposed to sprinkling it through the week, because you wanna make sure that it feels like you've done something that day. So in other words, it should feel like something as opposed to just doing it bits and pieces. He also then talks about how givers can be successful without becoming doormats by, again, focusing on the value that they're bringing and who they're bringing that value to. And you need to be careful of avoiding what's known as the sunk cost fallacy. And the sunk cost fallacy is when we've already given a lot, the tendency is, well, I've already given a lot, I may, well, I may as well keep giving, keep giving, keep giving. And that's not always good. So we need to recognize how we avoid that as well. Givers tend to show a lot of empathy, which can be useful, but sometimes that can be too overwhelming for them as well and not necessarily useful, particularly when they're negotiating. Finally, the last part of this book is Adam Grant looks at how group norms tend to influence individual behaviors towards more giving action. So this, the, this whole nature of building a culture of givers. And he looks at collaboration over competition and how by emphasizing collaboration over competition, we can be quite successful. He talks about how when you identify strongly with someone else, you tend to help more. So it gives an experiment where I think fans of Manchester United tend to see, saw someone in need of help or, and if I remember correctly, they would help the person wearing the Manchester United jersey a lot more than they would help someone else. Now that's kind of obvious in a way, but it speaks to the notion that whenever we feel part of a group, we're more likely to help people in that group. So what we need to be aware of, and this is known as the principle of unity by Dr. Robert Cialdini, we're more influenced by people that are in our group. It's important for us to recognize what groups we share with others. He also suggests using what's known as the reciprocity ring. And this is really gathering a group of people together and making it so that each person has a request for the group and the rest of the group offers how they can help, sort of like a mastermind. He cites Adam Rifkin, who practices the five minute rule. In other words, if you can help someone in five minutes, then you've no reason not to help. And Adam Grant also quotes research, which suggests that people tend to donate more money to charity when it's phrased as even a penny will help. In other words, give them a small amount of work to do if you're trying to get them to take action. So make it easy for people to give. That's what's critical. We need to make it so that people feel like this is possible to do. You also wanna publicly reward giving behaviors. Again, set low bars for giving and make it expected, make it something that you're expecting. And as a result of that, you will create this culture and you will make it so that you will make the world a better place. So wasn't that lovely? Look, look at that, it's give and take. Isn't that a nice, nice book? Give, be good, it's, it's lovely, it's nice. Next, let's look at originals. Originals is about being original, being creative. It's about you deciding, I'm going to sing my own tune. I'm gonna write my own story. I'm going to be my own best self. It's really, a lot of it comes down to being able to stand out in a crowded marketplace with lots of people that are the same. So it starts out by looking at how much of 
The modern world we live in is built around this notion of conformity, conforming with others. Even if you're on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok and you're like looking at everyone, it's like everyone is doing the same thing. And this can suppress us, this can hold us down, and this can make it so that we play it safe. And one of the impediments to success sometimes is the desire to stay safe instead of venturing into the unknown. This is not a million miles away from Jordan B. Peterson talking about chaos and order. Remember that chestnut, remember that idea. Now, while as Peterson went a lot more into the mythology and a lot more into the like things and the depth of that idea and concept, this is pretty much in a nutshell saying, hey, listen, the status quo isn't always the best way it needs to be. So we need to look at what can we do to change it or adjust it. One of the main ideas that I remember from this book is that to cultivate originality in children, we need to lower the number of rules that we enforce. So instead of, and again, this is something that Peterson mentioned as well, right? It's the notion that if you give children a million rules, well, they're not going to follow them all and it's impossible to remember. So make sure you prioritize and also justify the rationale behind the rules as well. Uh, lower born children, and I don't mean lower as in like, you know, less worthy children, lower born in terms of uh, younger children, right? The people that are second or third born tend to be more rebellious and original. And we'll get more into that. We'll also talk about child prodigies as well. So with all that said, let's get into what Professor Grant talks about when he looks at originals. There's a lot of thoughts out there that originals are these wild, crazy lunatics that just go, you know what, I'm quitting my job. I'm quitting this, I'm quitting that. I'm just going to do this. And while sometimes that happens, a lot of times originals are actually people who keep one foot in their job, their day job, while they actively work on what's known as the side hustle. And so they tend to actually do better according to the research. One of the things that Grant talks about is to generate good new ideas. It's really important to generate lots of ideas. So this whole nature of uh, it's quality rather than quantity. Well, actually, what Grant suggests is, is actually quantity delivers quality. So he talks about Edison having thousands of patents, Mozart having thousands of pieces, and we only know a few of them. Shakespeare again, need I continue? The more you do, the better you get, and the more you can find quality in that. It's like loads of episodes of the Change of Minds podcast, you know? And then you got like a no number of diamonds in the diamond store. So you thought I was going to say rough. I didn't say rough. No, it's the diamond store. So many diamonds. You go, oh, which one do I take? Whichever episode you like. It's much better to generate lots of ideas rather than trying to perfect the ideas. He also suggests broaden your experiences and look for other fields of interest for inspiration. So don't get locked into one area, which is great advice. And it's important to question why things are the way they are and how could they be better. And he then asked the question, well, how can you tell which ideas are good? And first of all, he says, look, you're more than likely a crappy judge of your own ideas. So what you need to do is go to someone with domain expertise that can help you, a colleague of yours. If you're an expert in this domain, the problem with that is, is that you can be overconfident in other areas. And as a result, you can make mistakes. If the stakes are high for you, that also will tend to lead to more erroneous conclusions that you'll make. So it's important for you to go to believable colleagues, people that you can trust that know the area, as well as your target audience also. By doing this, you get an idea of what your target audience is, what's important to them, but also you're looking at what your colleagues are thinking as well and you're getting that perspective. It's very easy for us to think because this new idea reminds them of an older idea. It must necessarily uh, fall down in the same way, but that would be an error as well. So we need to recognize that potential problem or that potential mistake. Idiosyncrasy credits comes back to the table again, That those things that I'm needing to earn more of. But what in this context he talks about is that you need to earn status in order to exert power. So he gives an example of college professors who can dress whatever way they like. Not everyone is as you know, careful about how they dress as certain people. But college professors tend to dress casually and they're given more authority as a result of this sort of casual dress because it's inferred that, well, they don't have to dress up so it's sometimes making less of an effort means that you're actually more important. I've been trying to communicate that for years. I've been trying to communicate, you know, through the way at which I don't really dress that well, that I'm not making an effort of it. So I must be very important. But nobody seems to be getting the memo. So I'm not sure I fully agree with that one. If you are likely to get defensive, skeptical reactions 
explore your original ideas, try powerless communication, again, that we talked about from the give and take book earlier. Speak to the top and the bottom of the totem pole, as is mentioned. So try to speak to very senior people and also speak to people on the ground floor that are new, even interns or new employees, because middle managers tend to be the most conservative. They tend to be much more away from risk and motivated away from risk in that concept. Communicate as much as you can with disagreeable people so you can find the holes in the ideas that you're coming to the table with and expose the new idea repeatedly in order to be able to gain traction, right? The more exposure, it's called the mere exposure effect in psychology, the more exposed people are to an idea, the more familiar it becomes, the more likely people are to like it and uh, more likely they are to be open to it as well. Then Adam gets into procrastination. And this is an interesting one because procrastination is obviously terrible. It's terrible you procrastinate, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I was gonna get to that earlier, but I just, you know, hesitated. See what I did there? Okay. But procrastination is actually really useful. And that's some of the research that Grant suggested is that it's useful to sometimes procrastinate because sometimes you can commit too much to an idea too early on. And procrastination allows you to get more input and idea, allows you to think more, allows you to be more creative. There's a whole host of different benefits to procrastination. Now, that's not an excuse for some of you to go, okay, well, I'll keep procrastinating and ruining my life then. No, if procrastination is ruining your life, stop procrastinating. However, if you find that some of the benefits you get from procrastination are that you're more creative, great, now you know why. He talks about the myth of the first mover advantage, says that, you know, when a company comes in and, and specializes in an area for the very first time, the pioneers, sometimes we champion them, like we champion talent and we go, oh, they've got the first mover advantage. But actually it's the ones, the settlers, as it's known, that comes in after the pioneers that tend to do even better. And they tend to do even better because they're able to imitate the pioneer, but they're also able to do new things and make sure that they don't make the same mistakes that the pioneer made. It's really important to recognize that as we are trying to become original, people who are older tend to be quite good in terms of innovation as well. There's two types of innovation. So conceptual innovators really represent the stereotypical brilliant young experts, right? The Zuckerbergs, the Elon Musk's, whatnot. But the experimental innovators tend to solve problems through trial and error. So a lot of people that have startups, let's say a little bit older, tend to do extremely well because they've learned a lot over time and they've trialed and tested lots of different approaches. And as a result of that, they tend to be quite good. There's also what Grant refers to as the Goldilocks zone in radicalism. There's a Goldilocks zone where you're radical enough to stand for something and not be tepid, but conservative enough to avoid alienating a mainstream audience. And the problem is a lot of times people on the extreme tend to hate people in the middle, like more than they hate the other extreme. So it's almost like there's a grudging respect that like we're lunatics on one side, you're lunatics on the other side and the middle, they're, they're disgusting, right? They're, they're not like us, even though like they're the opposite. It's, it's crazy. But what's important for here is, is that you're trying to find that sort of middle where you're radical enough to be different to the status quo, but at the same time, not too off the wall. You want to be able to make it so that when you're communicating with others, you're finding overlap in terms of the desired outcomes that you both have. So when you're communicating with someone that's a very different perspective and you're coming up with a original idea, try to find the overlap, try to find what you have in common. And if you can convert an enemy into someone who supports you or follows you, they're gonna be the most powerful persuaders for you moving forward. As I mentioned earlier, birth order has a very strong impact. There was a fascinating study which showed that out of 100 comedians, 83% were most likely to be last born. I'm last born as well. What does that tell you? Hmm? Rebels were twice as likely to be born last than first born. I was born last, a rebel. Later born children are more likely to adopt revolutionary scientific ideas. Belief leadership. Okay, scientific ideas, right, fine. They're also more likely to be risk-seeking, rebellious, and unconventional. Oh my goodness, I feel like this is speaking to me. I just wanna read this paragraph over and over again. Anyway, why is this? What are the theories? Well, first of all, there's what's known as niche picking. And niche picking is that the younger child seeking an identity finds it difficult to compete with the firstborn child. Don't know what that's about. 
and attract enough attention. Therefore, they seek niches like humor and rebellion to attract attention. That doesn't sound nearly as positive as I thought it was going to sound. That's not nice. Then there's caretaker effects. The last born experiences more freedom, right? Because it's not as micromanaged as the first one. And as a result of that, they tend to go into all sorts of different things. And this is not very positive at all. Another important point is that integrating morality as part of the child's identity is important if you're a parent to try to nurture originality. So instead of saying sharing is great, instead you say you're great at sharing. So you're a really good sharer, right? You're putting the label of sharer on them. And by labeling them as a sharer, that starts to hopefully become the kind of person that they see themselves as. And you really want to move and create a separation. And this is a lovely concept from the logic of consequences to the logical of appropriateness. So the former logic of consequences is like, if you do X, then Y will happen. Whereas the logic of appropriateness is, what would a person like you do in this situation? And that whole phrase that a lot of religious people would ask, which is, what would Jesus do? That's the logic of appropriateness is what would this person do in this situation? Or what would a person like me, a sharer like me, a giver like me do in this situation? And more creative children tend to grow up with fewer rules and emphasize moral values rather than specific rules. So don't get lost in the detail. The key is to be able to find role models for the children that tend to not just be the parents as well. And then lastly, rethinking groupthink. Groupthink is obviously when in a group together and everyone starts to formulate around the same kind of concepts, you need to be able to challenge groupthink. And one of the most important causes of groupthink, uh, Grant suggests based on the research, is overconfidence and how actively dissenting voices are encouraged or rewarded. And what's important is to make sure that we're challenging, challenging, challenging the status quo, challenging each other, cultivating that kind. He talks about uh, Bridgewater Associates and Ray Dalio and the approach of being able to give very direct feedback to each other and creating that kind of culture. Well, that's not going to be working for everyone and everywhere. It is important to assign devil's advocates to take up the other side and not just try to poke holes in this, but try to get people who are good at poking holes, try to get people who legitimately have grievances or problems or disagree with some concepts. He says, eject the maxim, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. In other words, encourage people to bring you problems even if they're not sure how to solve it because you want to be able to make sure that you let people know you're not afraid of tackling the difficult things and instead of discussing options for a decision one at a time try to get the group to rank them according to which they would pick in terms of the alternative so have discussions around them to get more detail and more information about that. He encourages two things, strategic optimism and defensive pessimism. He says strategic optimists tend to reinforce the belief that things will work out, whereas defensive pessimists predict the worst that can happen in excruciating detail. He says pessimists visualize all the things that could go wrong, but by controlling that risk, they feel more in control. And his recommendation is, if you're uncommitted to a particular action, if you're not 100% sure, then use strategic optimism. Whereas if on the other hand, you've committed to an action, then it's better to think defensively and to use defensive pessimism. And you want to be able to do that because if you're committed to an action, it means you can start to predict, okay, what are the potential things that could get in the way? Whereas if you're uncommitted to an option, you want to be strategically optimistic to get you to start to be more focused moving forward. It's also important to make sure when you're having conversations about doing things that you're bringing in people that are going to be influenced by your work rather than relying solely on the company's leaders. You want to hijack and avoid what's known as loss aversion. This is whenever we tend to weigh the, the dangers of a problem, what we risk uh, more than we actually value the gain. And so the way in which we do that is, is that when you present the arguments, you emphasize the cost of not doing something, not just the cost of doing something. So it filters that out. You also can use what are known as the red team attacks instead of directing people to come up with innovative ideas you actively get them, recruit them to do whatever they can to poke holes and to destroy the company. And the reason for that red team is you want them to be motivated to try to poke every single possible hole so that you can be prepared and you can be ready if someone from the outside does that. Lastly, he talks about controlling anger. And one of the best ways to control anger is instead of hitting a punching bag and thinking of the person's face, which honestly, it really helps me. Uh, it, it, I mean, I'm still angry at the end, but 
you know, I feel good about myself because I've really hurt that person that that's pissed me off. But he suggests that actually the research shows that focusing on the victim of the injustice, if it's not you, and imagining yourself fighting on behalf of that person tends to make you feel a lot better and tends to create a better system as well. Another book that Adam Grant wrote, he wrote with Sheryl Sandberg, it's called Option B, and it's about resilience in the face of adversity. This is something that Cheryl and Adam worked on after Cheryl lost her husband. And in it, they talk about a number of aspects. One of the, the key takeaways is the importance of acknowledging adversity and talking about grief and, and making it so that it's not something that you ignore, that you're open to talk about it. They emphasize the importance of personal growth and taking care of yourself and showing compassion to yourself, seeking support, making sure you reach out to the community and let them know you're struggling. They talk about resilience in the workplace, the importance of organizational support, good leadership, and creating a, a culture that emphasizes the importance of empathy and flexibility. And some of the strategies they use when they talk about building resilience include finding joy in the small moments, again, being compassionate to yourself, finding meaning and the lessons in the adversity, practicing gratitude and having a gratitude journal, and setting realistic goals and celebrating, no matter how small the progress that you're making, celebrating those small little pieces of progress. One other thing I wanted to mention, and then we'll get to some quotes and then we'll wrap up, is an, an article that Adam Grant wrote on languishing. And languishing is this notion of a feeling of stagnation and emptiness. And he says that this is something that became quite prevalent in, especially around 2020 or so. And it's between depression and flourishing. So it's not necessarily being like down, my life is over, this is the worst, or oh, everything's amazing. It's somewhere like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually a good sound effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like the sound of languishing, right? And that sounds like a cool thing. That could be like the name of a song, The Sound of Languishing. Love it. Or even a book, The Sound of Languishing. It'd have to be a fiction book though, I reckon. How to handle languishing. Some of the strategies, he says, small successes. So again, lower the bar, small successes for you to achieve. Engage in flow activities, occupying yourself in something that challenges you, but that you're good at. Again, acknowledgements from other people that talk to other people about what you're feeling. Oftentimes they'll be feeling it as well. Give yourself daily goals, connect with more people, practice mindfulness and gratitude and all that, and seek professional help if you need it. So there's some basic fundamentals there. We'll finish on just giving you some quotes of Professor Adam Grant in terms of originals and give and take. One of the quotes he says is, if you don't hire originals, you run the risk of people disagreeing but not voicing their dissent, which can be insidiously bad for a culture of an organization. Strong leaders engage their critics and make themselves stronger. Weak leaders silence their critics and make themselves weaker. So that's an interesting one. And once again, talking about, let's talk. Let's talk about the challenges you have. Let's talk about what you have to critique. What you need is a challenge network. This is an important one. I think of a challenge network as the group of your most thoughtful critics who are able to hold up a mirror so that you can see your blind spots and then know how you need to rethink. And he talks more about the challenge network in terms of Think Again, which we'll get to in a future episode. But this challenge network is don't just have a bunch of people saying, oh my goodness, oh, you're amazing, you're wonderful, you're superb, you're brilliant. Try to find people that can also give you some criticism. Don't get me wrong. For someone like me, finding someone to actually criticize me or find something that I'm doing wrong, it's so hard. It's so difficult. I constantly ask people, what, what do you not like? Unless I go into social media or YouTube or I read any of the comments about my videos when people say nasty things or I read the reviews of my books, then it's kind of easy to find people that are in my challenge network. That's not the kind of challenge network because sometimes people are like saying stuff because it makes them feel good to make you feel bad. But a challenge network is people that genuinely have your best interests at heart. So I love that concept. And then procrastination may be the enemy of productivity. Sometimes it is, but it can be a valuable resource for creativity, not a reason to make it an excuse. I'm just being creative. Why didn't you do this work? I was being creative. Why didn't you get this done on time? I was just trying to do my creativity. Doesn't work. 
And then I think the worst way to be more productive is to set your sights and be more productive. I've said this in a previous podcast, so I like the fact that we're on the same page. What you want to do instead is focus on a reason to be more productive. And I think the foundation of creating psychological safety is making it acceptable and even encouraging for people to raise problems if they haven't figured out a solution yet. And that speaks to what he talked about there. My thoughts overall in these two books is I think originals and give and take are both excellently written. Lots of good uh, detail and insights there. Sometimes I think Adam, and we'll talk more about criticisms at a later episode, but sometimes Adam is accused of going on often rambles and rambling on or giving anecdotes in, in lieu of science. I actually don't think that's the case. I think Adam Grant is one of the people that almost everything he comes out with, he will then cite a study. If you ever hear him on a podcast, the guy just, he's got like a photographic memory for studies and he's like, well, there was a research study. Well, there was a research study. Well, and I know I can be bad like that, but I think he's even worse. And by worse, I mean better, you know, both. But the point is, I think that he is definitely an excellent author. I'm frustrated because I'm kind of jealous of his uh, success in writing ability. So good for him, but I'll catch up and uh, I'll be able to do it, but I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to be original and I'm going to give you as much value as I can. Thank you very much for watching. I really hope you found this useful. We've looked at two of the books in depth of Professor Adam Grant. In another episode in the future, we are going to tackle two of his other books. Think again, which I have here. Well, I'll show. I'm going to give you a, a sneak preview. We have Think Again, which is one of my favorite books, and then Hidden Potential, his latest book. Nice covers as well. I mean, kudos to the cover creators. Uh, they look pretty good. But we're going to look at those two books. We're going to dive into those, and we're going to share more wisdom and insights from the work of Adam Grant. For now, please do spread the word to everyone else. And uh, if you are looking for a cool video, one is going to pop up as soon as I'm finished speaking. And it is one of the past episodes of the Change Your Mind podcast, which I think you are going to absolutely love. Why? Because it's the Change Your Minds podcast. Why wouldn't you? Thanks very much. Take care. Be well. And may you continue to be original. May you continue to give, give, give. And may the force, as always, be with you. Take it easy.